Last week, Paddy Gormley told us about his extraordinary methods of verse writing and explained how the characters of 2020 Visions only came to life once he had devised an appropriate pattern of rhymes and rhythms for each character. It was fascinating stuff. I've been working on this project for three years now, and until these interviews, I never realised how much hidden depth there is in this remarkable script. I've always been excited by Paddy's play, but I'm only now beginning to understand why. So if you missed last week's posting, number 12, you really must go and listen to it. Now, Paddy, I've got a feeling you're going to surprise me again. I do hope so. Oh, good, so do I. I remember when we first met to discuss the project in 2015, I said that we needed appropriate music for each of the characters. And you came up with the answer (laughs) immediately. You sent me links and I, well, I just thought it was beautiful and so right for the characters of the play. It came to me very readily. Since my teenage years, I've been into music, so-called classical music, though there's generally nothing remotely classical about it. The Rite of Spring was on my A-level music syllabus and I was hooked. I started going to the proms in my summer holidays, 1971, I think. And when I moved to London to go to university, I had access to live concerts all the year round. I was even a third-rate music critic for a few years. So I had a pretty good grasp of the repertoire, and not least the music of Claude Debussy, who accounted for no fewer than three of my choices. We're even using a recording of you playing one of the pieces that you chose for 2020 Visions. That's right. La Cathédrale Engloutie, uh, The Cathedral Under the Sea, from Debussy's first book of preludes. I was never a good pianist, much too lackadaisical. Debussy's music suited me very well because it's so gorgeous and yet it leaves lots of room for imprecision. This is unlike real classical music where you can't get away with the slightest thing. Anyway... My performance was intended to recall Alec Twenty's student performance, and he was a science student, as I was a science student, so he didn't need to be any better than I had ever been. Tell us how you came to choose that piece. It's not the perfect starting point, actually, Morris, because I chose that music, the Debussy, in 2015, as you said, but my first choice of music came much earlier, in the winter of 2000, 2001, in fact when I was drafting the script. Oh, tell us about that. It's from Britain's opera, The Turn of the Screw, Uh based on the short story by Henry James. You may remember the old black-and-white film version, The Innocents. No, I can't say I do. Never mind. A bleak country house is haunted by the ghosts of two corrupt servants who come back to claim the souls of the two children of the house. Sounds a lot scarier than 2020 visions. The connection has more to do with Britain's method of composing than with Henry James's story. Ever inventive Britain chose to set the opera as a theme and variations. That's where you take a musical theme and then embellish it in some way? Embellish is good. The scenes of Britain's opera are punctuated by orchestral variations, embellishments of the theme. And... It's all a bit spooky, at least the bit we hear in 2020 Visions. You even use it to spook Alec when he recalls the darkest moments of his life, like the moment when Natasha threw him out. The music comes back to haunt him. So there's a haunting in 2020 Visions also. That's all true, but as I said, the real reason for choosing it was Britain's music. His theme uses all 12 notes of the chromatic scale. In this sequence. Now that sounds pretty unexciting, but once you begin to recognise that you can move the notes down as well as up and play them in lower or upper registers, it becomes quite interesting. Because what Britain does is this. Starting in the bass... And that becomes a little four-note theme in itself. And that brings us to the really interesting bit. The second set of four notes is a variation on the first. Not embellishments, as you suggested, but changes in pitch and register. 
And the third set is a further variation in a higher register still. So Britain's theme is not just a theme, but a theme and variations in itself. Are you saying Belinda is the theme within the theme? You've got it. And uh, see, and Natasha and Lucy are the variations. Paddy, that's just completely wonderful. Why did I never think of that? Oh, it's all become very clear. Thank you. When we had a reading of the play in 2016, a friend in the audience told me he was disappointed that it wasn't autobiographical. Alec was so interesting, he said, having it away with grandmother, mother and daughter, whereas I was just a boring old husband and grandfather. A settled family life wouldn't have made Alec's play very interesting, of course, but I decided to give Alec a piece of my mind, literally, so that he would enjoy all the same symmetries and curds and metaphors and literary and musical references that I enjoy. But the Britain excerpt comes in a scene with Natasha, so Alec was just 40. He didn't know at that stage that there would be a further variation. I think you're taking this a bit too Oh, I've gone Morris. too far now. Uh. It's important to remember that that scene, like all the 2020 vision scenes, is playing out in Alec 80's mind. The visions are memories, and therefore fundamentally unreliable. The stylized language is unreal, but in the world of Alec 80's mind, everything is possible. He remembers getting Natasha interested in his sort of music. You're great, Natasha. It was so brave of you. It's absolutely fascinating. It's quite obscure, this music. Hence the massive crowd. If it wasn't for the subsidy, I dare say we would not be hearing this. I really liked the clockwork thing. Oh, the ligety. The spiky bits, especially. I liked the micro-polyphonic writing best. What's that? The music that seems static, but is full of imperceptible melodic shifts. It's, it's like a cloud that drifts from shape to shape without you noticing. The Britain connections came to him years later, but he's mixed the two memories together. Which reminds me, there is another thing about Britain's theme. All the notes of the theme are sustained by the orchestra. Winds, harp, tuned percussion strings. So each set of four notes is piled on top of the previous one, with the pitch rising all the way, until there's a great cacophony of sound. For me... This is a metaphor for the mind of Alec, where all those memories are playing simultaneously, cacophonously, relentlessly, building up to a deafening climax. I'm only sorry I can't play it at this point for copyright reasons. Wow. See, I've always been in awe of musicians because you have your own language. And once you share that with us... We are inspired and we love it. It's so beautiful. Thank you. I, oh, I'm fabulous. Thank you. Right, so we need to move on. And yet we've only just begun. I suppose you're going to tell me that your choices of Debussy's music are equally fascinating. I am, actually. Why am I not surprised? So what we've decided to do is to create a further music blog, which is exclusive to supporters of our current crowd funding campaign on kickstarter.com. The entire preview run of 2020 Visions next February amounts to just 350 tickets. So we're giving priority booking to people who support us on Kickstarter. So please tune in to our Kickstarter page to be sure you don't miss this amazing play. Visit our website 2020.productions and make sure you don't leave it too late. The initiative ends on the 30th of November. We'll be back here next week as usual when we'll be talking about the further developments in the script that have taken place in the last couple of years, beginning with a programme about Actors and Writers London, the professional play reading group where Paddy and I met and where Paddy's play had its very first reading in an early version in 2001, and where we've worked with all the lovely actors who have helped this wonderful project along the way down the years.